In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> My dear friends, we enter the sacred season of Passion. The time when we recall in the spirit of profound reverence and gratitude the terrible sufferings our Lord endured on our behalf. We find ourselves providentially during this time, we must believe in, suffering as well. With the coronavirus crisis, and all of the uncertainty that it means on so many levels, our everyday lives significantly altered, and feeling probably very isolated again on every level, and spiritually especially, for the church is locked. We are deprived of the mass, and to a great extent deprived of the sacraments, which are so important to Catholic life. Our hearts are heavy. And the temptation is very great to allow ourselves to fall into a discouragement that only weakens us and may even paralyze us. Paralyze us in our efforts to be what we're meant to be. Love our God, to take care of the souls entrusted to us. Many a soul finds facing each new day right now more and more difficult. Some become cranky and irritable. Some seek an escape of one kind or another, online or binging movies or games. Some shut down completely. Whatever the reaction, very often behind it is a discouragement. There was, but perhaps, more or less there all along. It is only the circumstances which have brought it to the fore. And why do I say discouragement? It was perhaps there all along. Because we get friends of our tendency to focus to a greater or lesser extent on the wrong things in everyday life. To let our gaze be turned away from what really matters and away from God. In consequence, our faith is not what it should be. It is superficial. And our spiritual life is weak. And in some cases, and so in times of crisis, we're easily overwhelmed. There's a striking incident that we read in the Gospels that helps us perhaps understand this. It took place just after our Lord had fed a great multitude, multiplying the loaves, seeking solitude from the great crowds that thronged about him. He instructed the apostles to cross ahead of him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he himself would seek solitude and pray. The apostles got in their boat and they tried to make their way as instructed to the other side. But the winds were great and the waves rose and fell and they were against them. They made little progress. Eventually, night fell. The darkness closed in upon them, and it stayed that way for hour after hour. The Gospels tell us that the night had reached its fourth quarter. St. John points out Jesus is still not come to them. The apostles did their best. But the wind only increased, and the sea grew more and more rough. St. Mark tells us that our Lord, seeing their struggles, came to them, walking across the sea. And the apostles at first did not recognize him. They were terrified, says St. Matthew. They thought it was a ghost. They cried out in fear. And our Lord spoke. Courage, he said, desire, do not be afraid. And Peter, Peter said, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you across the water. 
And our Lord looked at Peter and he said, Come. And Peter was immediately out of the boat and walking on the sea towards our Lord. A great miracle. But then his gaze was turned. From the Lord that he loved and so long to be with, to the storm. We read, seeing how strong the wind was, and how great the waves, he lost courage and he began to sink. Whereupon he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus at once stretched out his hand and caught hold of him, saying, Why did you fear? Oh, you of little faith. I think, my dear friends, that the application of this incident in the Gospels should be very clear to us. For darkness has fallen. We have before us still the task that our Lord has entrusted to us to cross the sea the solid lands of eternity, to go, in fact, to where he awaits us. But the sea rises high, and the winds blow powerfully against us, and it seems we are very much left alone to make our way. The great temptation is to let our gaze be drawn to the obstacles, to the unknown, to the storm. And to let fear take hold of us. To be terrified as the apostles were. And then as Peter. To lose courage. To lose faith in our God. And to begin to sink. We have to hear the voice of our Lord speaking to us. As he spoke to the apostles. Saying to us as to them. It is I. Not be afraid. We must lift our gaze to Him. We must look to His divine heart. We must continue to try to go to Him. We must walk on water. Do what perhaps humanly seems completely impossible. But able to do it because our eyes are on Him and Him alone. The great lesson of this incident in the gospel is very clear. The problem was not the storm. Peter was in peril not because of the wind or the waves. He was in peril because he let his gaze be turned from our Lord and he lost trust. He lost hope. He lost faith. And then he began to see. And the danger is the same for us. We must not let our gaze be turned from He who dwells in our souls and in the souls of our little ones. He who is there, very much there, in the midst of the storm, and ready to help us in any way we have need. We have to believe, my dear friends, that our Lord today, in the difficulties that we face today, extends his hand to us to help us. What does he want us to understand in this trial that we are undergoing? Perhaps that we were in peril, in peril before now, long before now, because our gaze was not where it should be. Not on him, not on our souls, not on the good of the souls of our children, not the way it should have been. Our gaze was on material things, our gaze was on pleasures, our gaze was on this world with its empty promises and constant agitation. And so we were very much in the present situation was allowed by God. I think perhaps, maybe even for all of us, to help us recognize our great, deep, our great need and just how much danger we were 
and do help us turn our gaze, turn our gaze to our God, turn our gaze to what matters, turn our gaze to our souls, and the work that God has entrusted to us. To take care of our souls, to take care of the souls entrusted to us, to be a light in this world of darkness. You perhaps have read the interview of Bishop Schneider that came out, I think, just two days ago. Or perhaps his letter, which came out maybe a week before that. He says, the coronavirus epidemic, in my view, is without doubt a divine intervention to chastise and purify the sinful world and also the church. Chastise, not in the sense that God would ever take revenge on the men of the church or on any one of us, but that He would correct us lovingly as a good father corrects and purify our souls, as Bishop Schneider says, cleanse us, sanctify us, bring us to new life. We have to accept the situation, writes Bishop Schneider, from the hands of divine providence as a trial, which will bring us a greater spiritual benefit than if we had not experienced such a situation. One can understand this situation as a divine intervention in the current unprecedented crisis of the church. God uses now the merciless world sanitary dictatorship to purify the church, to awaken those responsible in the church, and in first place the Pope and the Episcopate, from the illusion of a nice modern world, from the temptation to flirt with the world, from the immersion in temporal and earthly things. The powers of this world have now forcibly separated the faithful from their shepherds. The clergy is ordered by governments to celebrate liturgy without the people. This current purifying divine intervention has the power to show all of us what is truly essential in the Church, the Eucharistic sacrifice of Christ with His body and blood and the eternal salvation of immortal souls. May those in the Church who are unexpectedly and suddenly deprived of what is central, start to see and appreciate its value more deeply. As I think, my dear friends, we can see this trial of today as an invitation from our God, an invitation to step. I told this story a few months back in other circles but I think it bears repeating here. Last summer, a father of six young children, just 40 years of age, died tragically of a heart attack. He was a good man, a good man and a good father to his children, and he would firmly but kindly correct them when necessary. He would exhort them to do good. He would say to them, you have to step it up, son, you have to step up. And so it was when he died that his oldest boy, who was just 11 years old, said to the mother, Mom, I think I know why God allowed Dad to die. And his mother said to him, Why, son? And the boy answered, He wants me to step up. He wants me to step. And I think, my dear friends, that we must see the situation we face today in the same way. What a beautiful example of faith and generosity do we have in that young boy. Out of the mouths of babes, out of the young and innocent souls, we hear the message that we ourselves are meant 
to take to heart. Whoever we are, whatever our state in life, whatever our age, we are meant to step up. To stop looking at self, to stop living on the surface of things, to stop the half-hearted efforts to give of ourselves. To strive for our God, to strive for our families, to strive for the souls entrusted to us. Whatever our age, you younger ones, you little ones, your hearts are innocent and pure. Your offerings, your efforts are especially precious to God. Be generous. Be generous in doing the chores. Don't make mom or dad ask you twice for anything. Try hard not to bicker or fight. Try hard to be cheerful. And you older ones, resist the temptation to disappear at home. But let those around you struggle while you go into your own corner. Hide yourself behind a book or your phone or your video game or your earbuds. Girls, be there for mom. Don't leave everything on her shoulders. Be a help for the little ones. Occupy them, show an interest in them, look after them. And by your kindness and your cheerfulness to all in the family, be a source of joy and courage, one who lifts the spirits of all. Boys, you can help with the younger ones too. You can lead them. You can be an example to them in their school or teach them a little bit. Help them with a problem they might have. Teach them a game. Play board games with them. Organize the projects. They can help the whole family. It be a yard project, or building a sandbox for the little ones, or some activity for the family. Aim to be counted upon. Aim to carry your share of the load. Aim to be adult. Aim to be one your father and mother can look to. And you parents, focus on what can be done rather than on what cannot be done. Much is beyond your reach. That has to be left to God. But much is left to you. And that God intends you to do. Fathers, be proactive. Be proactive with your family. Looking to set a spirit in the home that is a steady spirit, a Catholic spirit, a serious, sacred, joyous spirit. What an example you fathers and mothers can be if you rise above in the present circumstances. What an example that your children will never forget. This is what the faith means. It doesn't matter what happens. We're steady. We're constant, we strive, we don't let it get us down, we keep going. Make sure you set a schedule in the home. Don't let everything just go in every direction. Just because normal things are not there the way they used to be, the school and so on, there still has to be order, there still has to be priorities. There still has to be a balance in family life. There are things that count more. There are things that count less. We don't want to let the easy escape become a way of life during these days and weeks, perhaps, that lie ahead. We perhaps have read that if you haven't, I encourage you to do so. The letter of Father Padre This is not the time, he said, to open the floodgates of the world into our homes. To turn on the screen and use it as a babysitter. We have to know what we're about. We have to stay on track. And fathers, perhaps this is a time we can make a difference outside the home too. Be proactive in trying to reverse the closure of our churches. What a travesty that the list of essential businesses 
is three pages long in this state of Idaho, but mentions nothing that pertains to the worship of God or the care of souls, while the state of home order itself specifically mentions that faith-based events are forbidden. What a travesty. What an indictment on our world. And I encourage you, organize. Organize amongst yourselves. Organize an online petition to the governor's office asking that the churches be open, that as long as prudential guidelines be observed, the pastors be allowed to take care of their sheep, and encourage those who sign that petition to call the governor's office as well, to be respectful, but insistent, to make some noise, to put some pressure, to help our governor realize this is his mission. We need all of us to step up and especially to strive to draw closer to our Lord, to renew and to deepen our spiritual life. You have a mess. Well, look after the spiritual life of the family in the best way you can. Pray your morning and evening prayers together. Pray your rosary without fail. On Fridays, do the stations of the cross together. Make an appointment to see the priest for confession and communion. Begin already to plan your holy week so that each day during that sacred trio is a special day that's marked in your home. Have a plan. Show the importance. Lift the gaze of your children. And God will bless you. The Master is here. He calls for you. You might recognize those words. They were spoken by Martha to her sister Mary after the death of Lazarus. The Master is here. He calls to you. And Mary went to him. And she said to him, Lord, if you had been here, the sorrow would not be what it is. But the answer is, no, that is not the case. The sorrow is what it was meant to be. The sorrow is what it had to be. What our Lord sees, it has to be. He seems far away, perhaps. But just as with the apostles rowing against the wind and the waves, he sees our struggles, and he comes to us already in his way. And he calls to us in our sorrow to look to him. He would purify our souls of the selfishness that too often rules our lives. And he would give us strength, his strength, the strength of heart that comes from his grace, the strength of heart that in fact comes down to simply knowing how to love. And so, my dear friends, let us look to him, look to his example, during his passion tide, look to his example in his sufferings, and let us unite our sufferings to his, and to those of his mother. You might recall that the last time we had Mass here, the Immaculate Conception of the Church, we made our consecration to Mary. We went to her in a special way. We gave ourselves to her, and we said to her, Use us. Use us for the work of your son. Whatever it means, we're ready. And then it was on the feast of her Annunciation, the feast of her great fiat, her yes to God. That was our last day of Mass. Isn't that not our God and our Lady both telling us this is part of their plan? So let us encourage, let us strive with strong hearts, hearts to look to them, no matter what the difficulties of the trials. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.